leaving a job at 23 24 that was paying me 30 lakhs per annum mm. in 2014 15 wow. 30 lakhs per annum then is probably 60 lakhs now yeah. or 75 lakhs now right that's a lot of money for me at that time and leaving that job and saying i'll get zero mm. was really really scary today as compared to 10 years ago an entrepreneur can find sources of capital much more easily whether it's angel investors or its government grants or its small incubators or accelerators associated with colleges or its micro vcs vcs private equity funds there is enough pools of capital available one thing that i didn't expect or i underestimated was the amount of failure you face as an entrepreneur right we hear and read about success stories we watch these podcasts instagram reels we read economic times we read your story we hear about unicorns we read about funding rounds and we think that's a very glamorous sexy exciting life in the startup world but the reality is that you bump your head and you fail many many more times than you succeed while building a startup hello bio family and welcome to the 12th episode of the barely opinionated show in this one we have arjun vaidya who is an entrepreneur and investor and the co-founder of a venture capital company called v3 ventures he is well known for his brand dr vaidya that he sold in 2019 for a whopping 100 crores which became one of the first successful d2c exits he now mentors early stage founders and runs one of the largest d2c founder community in india this conversation is filled with insights on building a business raising money and and running a startup so make sure to watch it till the end before we go ahead don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel so let's dive in okay awesome welcome to the barely opinionated show today we have a very very special guest mr arjun vaidya arjun how are you doing so excited to be here rohit i i'm excited to be in this space i think this podcast is uh, been overdue for a while <laughs> so We finally made it. We're doing doing yeah. it, so I'm really happy. Yeah, yeah. Fun story. We were supposed to do it back in uh, May, but and my then... WhatsApp crashed, <laughs> and then I just said I need to get out of Bangalore and get back home, wow. and I didn't have WhatsApp for a week. Wow. Uh, Living without WhatsApp for a week must have so been intense. I have now two mobile phones <laughs> because I never want to go through that situation again. So I have a backup at all times. <laughs> nice, nice. So uh, um, I, I mean, of course, you are famous for Doctor Vedya's, um, and and that story is all is that story is already out there, right? That you sold the company back in twenty one completely, Correct. and now you are also a, a an investor in startups. But again, like that story is out there. I don't want to go too much into that story. But what I want to know is. You've had that success with Arjun Vaidya. I mean, with Doctor Vaidya's, right? But what has been your biggest failure in 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 this whole journey of building the startup, or even before that? A lot of failures, to be honest. And I think the one thing that I didn't expect or I underestimated was the amount of failure you face as an entrepreneur, right? We hear and read about success stories. We watch these. podcast instagram reels we read economic times we read your story we hear about unicorns we read about funding rounds and we think that's a very glamorous sexy exciting life in the startup world but the reality is that you bump your head and you fail many many more times than you succeed while building a startup and you know um i think i was a great student in school hmm. one of the top students in school i got 44 out of 45 points in my ib wow got 95 plus percent in icsc I went to an Ivy League college. I graduated college 4.0. Wow. Three honor societies. So you're you're Sharma ji ka beta. <laughs> <laughs> then I had a kick-ass job out of college. Nice. I worked in private equity, and so things were going well until then. And then I started this company, and every day I would just like bump my head, completely mess up, have people say you're wasting your time, etc. Mm-hmm. That was very hard. I think biggest failure I would say I I don't know if there was one big failure but I think what I remember was the first failure. Okay. We started Dr. Vedas October 2016 we went offline. Mhm. And we failed miserably in offline. And I'm not going to talk about the story of why we failed exactly all of that. But I'm going to talk about the emotion from that, right? right. Because that's yeah, important yeah. to talk about. So I got I put 10 lakhs of stock in market through offline distribution. I didn't realize that That means that ten lakhs would have to sell for me to get paid. So three months later, when I went to get the money, I got only one lakh in cash and nine lakhs worth of returns of product, and oh. the world came crashing down. I had twenty-two sales reps. I'd made these Excel sheets of ten mm. lakhs, twenty lakhs, fifty lakhs, and it didn't work out. And I remember just like coming back and saying, "Look, I can't do this. Mm-hmm. I have really large competition with lots of money. I don't know offline. I don't have the experience. So this is not going to happen. It's mm-hmm. not going to work out, right?" And accepting that it was not going to work out. 
shutting down that team and just thinking about that whole process that weekend i literally got home on a friday evening mm -hmm. and i just shut the door locked mm -hmm. my room and i didn't get out the whole weekend and it must have been a shock because you a had shock. experienced success a lot a lot in life it was a huge shock mm -hmm. uh, and i mean i didn't know how to deal with it and i was just absolutely distraught and then i remember my girlfriend at the time who's now my wife and the mother to our baby mm. um she was like look this online thing seems to be doing well I, she was in the founding team at nike so she said it seems to be doing well and nobody's doing it in ayurveda so why don't you give it a shot interesting and uh, that started the next journey but i think that weekend was mm -hmm. something i never felt before and once you start feeling that more and more you then become okay with failure yeah. and you accept it and it happens all the time and look i'm not yet great at accepting failure mm -hmm. i'm not yet great at sort of things not working out mm -hmm. uh, but i think that um, it's it's something that you have to learn as you build a business great resilience thick skin and the ability to fight mm. tough times or get up from tough times is sort of really important i i see this quite a bit One of my favorite songs growing up was this um song called Tub Thumping by Chamba Wamba. Okay. And the chorus of the song he says something he says, I get knocked down but I get up again you're never going to keep me down. It's like the anthem for nice. entrepreneurs. That time I yeah, like the song yeah, for completely different yeah. reasons. It's like that. Very nice. And and ego also plays a very important role in this case, right? Because I I personally feel like because again I'm building this this is a completely bootstrap business right so we also experience a lot of failures and the smallest of the smallest things sort of set us back um and and I feel like the ego in me sort of keeps me going because I I I'm just like okay I cannot fail right I mean that's a very bad emotion to Correct. sort of I feel have but what do you think about that I don't that? have an ego anymore no? the amount of times i've failed or been proven wrong or thought i was going to be right and ended up on the wrong side of it i don't have an ego anymore and i do you feel your ego has completely shattered because of these experiences that you've gone shattered? through shattered no i think it's a good thing it's mostly gone away mm -hmm. uh, and i think that uh, it gradually went away mm -hmm. um and i think it's it just if you meet entrepreneurs the most successful entrepreneurs the what we call unicorn founders mm -hmm. etc all of that you find them to be some of the most humble people mm -hmm. right the most successful people i have found are the most humble people and i think that's a sort of characteristic that i've learned to enjoy um, and i've also learned to appreciate and i've also sort of learned to inculcate as you go through your experience as an entrepreneur uh, humility was also a very important part of my upbringing mm -hmm. right so my grandfather was a very successful doctor um, he was the person behind whose name we started dr vedyas mm. should see 350 patients a day he mm. had 12000 patients on a monthly basis right to buy a post he wore the same clothes every day mm. to work and very disciplined man like that white safari suit uh, black polished shoes the same <laughs> glasses every day but there was only one hint of color on him it was a red 5 rupee pen that he used to keep in his pocket and you know in school after the fourth grade or fifth grade you move from pencil to pen Right? correct so moving to pen and when we moved to pen i remember he gifted me a shafer pen okay in a nice box it was like a silver really color pen like velvet i don't know how it seemed like at that time it was some 3 4000 rupees okay. right but okay. for us at that time it was like yeah. you know all the friends had got parker pens correct it correct it was 5 700000 bucks and i had got the shafer pen and you know it had this like box with velvet in it and all and i asked him i was like you are giving me this pen mm. but you have this 5 rupee pen in your pocket he said no i have those pens mm. but this pen i mm. carry every day in my pocket not just to use as a pen mm. but that reminds me where i came from wow very interesting um again so when we when we talk about successful entrepreneurs successful founders another observation that i've that i felt personally and i want you to tell me also what you think is that one you said is humility right like the 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 biggest of the entrepreneurs are very humble and and very um sort of nice right that's what sort of makes them successful but second and the more important one is that most of the successful entrepreneurs at least what i have seen come from a a decent background right at least from a middle class or an upper middle class family which sort of gives them the gives them the cap capability to take the risk and become an entrepreneur right um because the 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 people at the lower sections of society don't necessarily have the have enough resources to be able to pursue their dream that they want to do you yeah, feel the a, same i think it's an important point you're making not talked about enough when you become an entrepreneur and when you leave your job 
or you leave what you're doing to do this, you have to basically forego salary for a period of time. Right? Mm. That could be one year, that could be six months, that could be one and a half years, etc. All of that. And that's very tough. Correct. For me, I was leaving a job at 23, 24 that was paying me 30 lakhs per annum mm. in 2014-15. Wow. 30 lakhs per annum then is probably 60 lakhs yeah, now yeah. or 75 lakhs now. Right? That's a lot of money for me Correct. at that time. And leaving that job and saying I'll get zero mm. was really, really scary. So it took a lot of time for me to rip off the band-aid and sort of go into my job. I'll say two things about this, right? The first thing is that my dad said at that point, don't take a big salary. You are earning weekly basis. So taking a small salary even to just take care of your expenses, especially mm. entrepreneurs who are sort of slightly more mm. senior and have families to take care of, etc. All of that, I think was an important practice that we took at that time. And don't take an exorbitant salary. Mm. Don't like if your company is doing five lakhs a month and you take three lakhs a month in salary, it's a disaster, right? <laughs> so obviously take it in mind of or in relation to the PL of the business, but take something. I think the other thing which I would agree is I, I'm not saying I came from a background where I, I didn't have uh, right. sort of safety net, I didn't have um, security mm. um, and I was fortunate that my family funded my business in the mm. first round instead of us raising external capital. But today, as compared to 10 years ago, an entrepreneur can find sources of capital much more easily, whether mm. it's angel investors or it's government grants or it's small incubators or accelerators associated with colleges, or it's micro VCs, VCs, private equity funds. There is enough pools of capital available. I remember I was going to pitch, there were very few people I could talk to or engage with or have a conversation. It was very with. nascent, the startups. It was very, very nascent. I think startups are mainstream now. I, hmm. I put a LinkedIn post few days ago. Mm -hmm. um, I was at Ganesh celebrations in Bombay right. on Tuesday, a um, few days back. And this is how mainstream startups have gotten, right? The guys, while they were chanting or, or sort of doing the RT, said, GP uh, ho ya PTM, Bappa is the ATM. Wow. Prime ho ya Hotstar, Bappa is a rock star. That's how deeply the startup scene, the Indian tech scene has penetrated. If you're part of Ganesh yeah. RT in yeah, Bombay, yeah. means you're absolutely mainstream. And so I think the last 10 years have been game changer for our ecosystem and our world. That's amazing. Um, uh, okay, I just want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about you selling Dr. Vaidya's, right? Okay, we, we know that you sold the company the magic number 100 crores. I know it might not be exactly 100 crores, but uh, around that ballpark figure, right? But then when we hear such stories of, okay, this company got sold for 100 crores, how much do you actually get in your bank account? Other than the tax, you get you get the rest, right? You, you, so, you get the so look, I'll tell you, there, there's a difference between Dr. Vaidya's and other companies, okay. right? Um, the difference is that other our investors were the people who bought the company. They were already on the cap table. Other than them, there was nobody on the cap table. Okay. We didn't have angel investors. We didn't have other VCs. We didn't have anything. So the other, other than our investors, there were four people on the cap table. Okay. Mom, dad, brother, me. Hmm. Right. Hmm. So I think for us, because the cap table was clean, uh, whatever the outcome was, a large part of it came to us. Uh, but when you have obviously various investors on the cap table, um, some of them who are institutions have this thing called. Um, liquidity preference, anti-dilution, etc. All of that. So I think keeping all of that in mind, first the investors, first the debt holders need to be right. paid, then the investors need to be paid out, and then whatever's left is for the founders. Mm. Uh, outcomes are not enough mm. in our country for founders, mm. um, but that's a function of the nascency of the ecosystem. Okay. I think over the next five, seven years, you'll see it. Mm. Um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind, Rohit, as I sort of have been through this experience and, and then I see what founders are going through, Look, there is lots of capital going in, but when VCs invest, it's usually what we call primary. Okay. It's money going in the company and not money going into the founder's, founders pocket or founder's mm -hmm. bank account, etc. All of that. And so sometimes founders make the mistake of saying, my last valuation multiplied by my shareholding is my net worth. Okay. Let's say I raised at 100 crores mm. valuation, mm. right? Post money. And I own 50% of the company. Founders make that calculation and obviously I, I don't blame them for me that I'm worth 50 CR. Right. The problem is from sort of illiquid shareholding in company to actual outcome is a big difference, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times you see those things go up and down. And the problem is over the last two, three years, we've just seen up, 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 up. Now we're seeing down. Now we're seeing down. And we're seeing real cycles and stuff like that. So it's important to keep in mind there's a big difference between primary and secondary. And not a lot of people know this. Money going to shareholders versus money going to the company is a very different thing. For in your case, it was a very clean sort of a... But also the specific situation which I explained. Right, right, right. right. Interesting. But, and now, when we talk about this, this Ayurveda space, right? 
Ayurveda in general, like when you when we look at the US, you, the West market essentially, it's grown it's grown massively, right? Ayurveda is something that comes from the roots of India, but then uh, companies and startups in the US have been sort of able to capitalize. Um, I I can't, I don't know if it's better, but at least at the level at which India is right now capitalizing, right? And I think they were able to do it sooner than we were able to. And I don't know if we have been able to really penetrate that market like we should because essentially we we are the we are the Correct. people behind it so why did i start dr vedyas right i started dr vedyas from my experience in the us i started okay. dr vedyas um because i went to college in the us and i saw my dutch friend teaching me yoga and i saw yoga pants and yoga gyms and yoga pal and lulu lemon i saw multi billion dollar industry yeah. in the us i started thinking to myself it's amazing that yoga is global mm. But it's not so amazing that Indian companies have not taken yoga to the world. And I'm guessing that at that point there were no Indian companies that were even in the horizon. Even or if there was, it was very little, right? The okay. Yoga market in the US is dominated by American companies, but yeah. yoga is Indian. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. We should claim it, right? Exactly. So I saw a multi-billion-dollar industry created by taking something from India, repackaging and selling it again in a new age format, right? And that's where the <laughs> idea and the thought process for the opportunity of Dr. Vedya arose. Okay. The idea was. I called my grandfather from campus and I said, "Hey, we can't let the same happen to Ayurveda. We have to be Indian companies taking Ayurveda to the world." Mm -hmm. And that was the idea. Can we repackage and rebrand Ayurveda to appeal to modern consumers? It came from this. Yes, I think exports in Ayurveda still remains a large opportunity. I think we have not done enough as an ecosystem, as an industry. I think there are some complications with Ayurveda as well, right. because Ayurvedic products are usually supplements, and so it goes into ingestion, and so there are different rules in different countries of what ingredients are used. These ingredients are indigenous to India. Mm. A lot of these ingredients are not even available in those markets. Mm. So, for those sort of regulatory bodies and equivalents of the US FDA to understand what this is takes time, effort, energy. The good news is there's a Ministry of Ayushna, mm. right? so they are making steps forward. Correct. But I think um, traditional Chinese medicine is sort of much larger than. Ayurveda or Indian Ayurveda um, globally, and so we have a long, long way to go. So I had the founders of uh, India Hemp Organic um, uh, on one of the shows, and and we spoke about the cannabis industry. Right now, cannabis and Ayurveda sort of go hand in hand. What what do you think about the about the cannabis industry, the way it's growing in India, and what do you think more can be done in this industry? Itself? You know, they are awesome founders. I'm an advisor in their company oh, as okay, well. Okay, okay. Uh, so I know them quite well for the last year and a half. Uh, look, I, I would say that there is sort of some amount of mention of Vijaya leaves right. in Ayurvedic scriptures, uh, but I think regulation-wise, we are not there yet. Right? Until um, the the products definitely have some amount of benefit if used responsibly, and we have to also keep in mind that uh, there will be some people yeah. who abuse the medical nature of these products, etc. All of that. But if used responsibly, there could be some. Um, positive benefits for these products, but I think regulation-wise, we have still some way to go. Mm -hmm. um, Ministry of Ayush, NDPS, Correct. all of this has to come together to make it more mainstream. They, they made a very interesting point that back in the 1960s and 70s, the West sort of made the whole world shut off cannabis uh, from their telling lives. It to go. They're yeah, telling and now they are down. they have sort of opened up their cannabis markets, which is which is a billion-dollar industry altogether. Look, another thing I'll say about laws and regulation in India. We are a large country with lots of people, um, diverse groups of people, and so when laws are made, they have to be made keeping a large group of people in mind. Right? And so I think that's why it's taken some time for this regulation to come up. I don't know where it'll go, mm -hmm. but until regulation supports, mm -hmm. you cannot mainstream advertise these products. You're blocked from advertising, banned from advertising, etc. So growing into a large business could be difficult. Interesting. Now, uh, now that you've sold Doctor Vedya's. When you when you randomly see Doctor Vedya's pop up on the street and and you know you just see Doctor Doctor Vedya hoarding or whatever, does it feel weird? What, like how do you feel? <laughs> it's bittersweet. <laughs> <laughs> and and how how do you do you feel like the direction in which say Doctor Vedya's is going now? I don't know if you can talk about it or not. What do you feel about it? Do you feel they're doing justice to it? Do you feel it's going well? See, I'll tell you two things about this. Right. The first thing is that uh, the reason we sold the business, obviously, there was. Fair value being offered, etc. All of that. But the business was doing very well online. The next leg of growth would have to be offline. Okay. I told you about my offline yeah. failure, so clearly I was not the right person <laughs> to take the business offline. Uh, and so I thought our investors had great, have great offline presence, and so they would be the sort of custodians to take the brand forward. And I think from that perspective, uh, it it went off 
or or it's going along quite nicely the other thing is one thing my dad told me as i sold the business he said arjun you took this business when it was a seed mm. you sowed that seed and you took it till it became a plant mm. now whether it becomes a very very large tree or it remains a plant or it becomes smaller it's not your destiny anymore mm. so you are now a customer and a fan and a well wisher of the brand and i i i i hope and i pray and i i believe as well the dr vedas will do very well because the brand is very strong ayurveda is only growing and there's lots more to be done but it's not my destiny anymore and I, i'm not i'm not it must be a very bitter sweet feeling when you think it is a bitter sweet feeling yeah it is a big achievement as well at 29 yeah, to be course. able to sell a company and all of those of things course. but yeah i i i would see my family names in it so sometimes <laughs> i miss it so after after such an exit uh, after such a successful exit what where do you go like i know you're 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 an investor now but then after that point do you even have any motivation left to go through that hustle again of building something new nothing changed by the way you know really? like i built it up a lot in my mind and mm. then we all built it up my wife included built it up a lot and then there was one moment when it was complete mm. the docs were signed mm. the money was transferred mm. and that was it and then there's huge weight So it just got off your shoulder. lifted off my shoulders, and it just felt very light for a little bit. And then I thought, yeah, oh, now the dream, right? Like you always dream. Can I just have three months to do <laughs> whatever I want? Like, so I had that period. I mean, for, with hundred crores, you can go on for longer. Three months is a little less. No, but you think about it. In life, we always oh. dream, right? Like, you want Sunday to extend by three more days. Correct. Right? <laughs> Just imagine if you have Sunday extending for three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You dream about that, right? Right. And then I used to play squash at instead of like eight nine a.m. Mm. before work, I would play squash at ten thirty a.m. <laughs> because there was no one at the squash courts, and I wanted to improve my table tennis game. So I would call this coach who would come and train me at two p.m. Wow. for table tennis, and then I was like, I want to start sort of brushing up on my Spanish because I learned mm. Spanish in college, and then you know we'd like be like, okay, let's go out for. a long dinner and have a few <laughs> drinks on a tuesday night and stuff like that right but very quickly that wears off like you get bored after yeah, a point you get you get so we thought we'll travel a lot okay and i think that's my biggest regret mm-hmm. second wave hit and so we couldn't travel so okay. we just went outside of bombay to our house in alibag mm. um so that's one regret that you know we could have used the time to travel a lot and see a lot of the world and that would have been awesome mm. uh, but that we couldn't do unfortunately okay. And so yeah it was just uh, it was a great time for a short period of time but I think you get back into the grind because um look I think I am one of those people and I see a lot of entrepreneurs like that who have infinite motivation mm-hmm. just want to keep getting better keep doing more keep keep building sort of and building, building and building and building and so I I got back into it very fast and and I think that sort of um that characteristic of hard work and of keeping on going on and getting better every day and improving every day is just inherent in me right when we reached 100 orders a day it was a dream for me to reach 100 orders a day on my website and then i wanted 200 and 500 and 1000 and 2000 and 5000 it just keeps going right yeah actually i've, I've i even have realized that but that's bad as well um, the hunger doesn't stop the hunger doesn't stop but sometimes it puts you on a treadmill that you keep going and i'll be honest and admit and confess i'm on that treadmill <laughs> I want to keep getting better. I want to keep improving. I want to keep doing more. I want to just do better and better and better. Right? But money someone. is no more the motivation. I'm guessing, or is it? See, money was never the motivation. Okay. If you do something for money, you won't get the money. Mm. Right? You do like a lot of people ask me. Um, even I want to exit my business. Mm. If you start thinking I want to exit my business, nobody will buy your business. Yeah. Right? Build a good business. You will have various options along the way, and then maybe this could be one of them. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it's okay. but now that you are on the other side so so you you've uh, cl- uh, you sold dr vedyas and now you have your own uh, vc firm as well right um what is it like to be on the other side of the table at this point and do you, when when you sit on the other side of the table now do you realize that okay maybe i made these mistakes when i was on on 100% all the time by the way it's 24 and a half when i started my business huh. i can tell you all the mistakes i made as well i didn't hire a team fast enough i didn't understand what was retention we focused on brand too late at dr vedyas i tried to do a lot of things myself um we didn't hire smarter folks than me or than us in functions until two and a half years in lots of mistakes mm. lots and lots of mistakes but from those mistakes from those learnings from that experience of building exiting failing succeeding etc all of that there is something different that ex entrepreneurs or operator investors bring to the table than than the so uh, 
I mean, there has to be an edge for you as an investor than say another like a, a another like a VC investor because you have been on the other side of the table as well. And there's a pro and a con. Hmm. The pro is you've been on the other side of the table, you've built and you know certain things that someone who has not built or so, not. So they can't the, they can't bullshit, right? They not gone bullshit. through the emotion, empathy, cycle, ups and downs, roller coaster of building knows the technicals of the business. If I see someone's Facebook account, I can understand what's wrong with their Facebook account. I know the difference between WooCommerce and Shopify. I can code a website. I've done all of these things. Right? I know how to set up a warehouse. I know how to pack orders. I know I've packed orders myself, so I know yeah. how many orders should be packed per person per day in the warehouse, etc. Yeah. So those things I know, and that's great, right? Because it allows you to get into one level deeper of conversation. But there is another problem, right? Mm. As an entrepreneur, because you've done something, you sometimes overthink mm. things or you may believe certain things are not possible because you've done it in a different time. And that sometimes prevents me from believing something that an investor could believe. So there's a pro and a con. Okay. okay. That's interesting. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to switch gears and, and, and go into a little bit of talking about India in general now, right? Um, I, w I will get to the startups Ba I'll get back to the startups part of it, but I want to understand your perspective on this discussion of India versus Bharat, right? I'm not talking about the name change and all that. That's a different conversation. But what I'm talking about is the market distinguishment when it comes to startups between India and Bharat, right? When we when we talk, when we say India, we usually refer to like the tier one, um, the tier one market, right? But when we talk about Bharat, that's where we talk about the essence of Bharat, right, which is the tier two, tier three, um, tier four markets of India, which is where the majority of the population stays. And now I feel like a lot of the startups um, that are coming about, many of them focus heavily on the tier one market, which is India, but they forget about Bharat completely. What do you think about this conversation? Firstly, I'll tell you this classification of India and Bharat as per tier one, tier two, tier three cities, tier four cities is completely incorrect. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, and I, I don't agree with saying India is top 5% in right. terms of income and Bharat is the rest, etc. All of that. But if we assume that that's the way people are classified, and I don't classify like the people classified like that. Um, there is Bharat in Bombay. There is Bharat in Delhi. There's Bharat in Bangalore. There's Bharat in Chennai as well. Mm. There are people earning 15, 20,000 rupees a month as well who exist. Like we have uh, an investment in a company called Cuckoo FM. People say it's a sort of audio content platform for Bharat. They have a lot of users in Bombay. Yeah. And so this classification, India is a country of diversity, hmm. India's cities are cities of diversity and so there may be the richest man in India living in a city, there may also be someone who is sort of not as wealthy and they co-exist in the city hmm. and so saying that a product caters to a tier 1 consumer tier 1 has all shades, right? I think, I think uh, when we say tier 1, I think it's more I think it's become more of like the economic segment correct, than correct. like the now, geographic segment. Now I think on the economic segment, if you think about it, the reason why people sort of build for the economic segment that you would say is India mm. or the economic segment that you would say is the top 5% of India in terms of income is because that's where they are from. Mm. Correct. And so if you think about brands, right? Brands is the one thing where when you build something, you're actually a consumer of it as well. And so there's lots of personal bias that creeps in. If it's not yours, mm. it'll be your friends, it'll be your family, it'll exactly. be your relatives, it'll be people around you, it'll be people in your team, etc. All of that, right? And so now that I've built a brand where 82% of our customers are outside top 10 cities, we are truly a Bharat brand in the classification that we are talking about. I realize that sometimes the way I consume is the exact opposite way the opportunity is, right? Exactly. Example, I'm a gluten-free, sugar-free consumer in terms of eating preferences. Why do I do that? Because of my personal choice of health. I'm not right. gluten intolerant. I'm not pre-diabetic yet at least. <laughs> uh, but I don't invest in that manner. Hmm. I've invested in a company called Jimmy's Cocktails. I have never in my life tried the product because it's loaded <laughs> with sugar. There's a market for that product. It's right. not for me. But a lot of times people say, I didn't like the product. It's not for me, etc. All that. You got to sort of remove your personal bias hmm. from that conversation or from that economic decision. And that's once you allow yourself to do that, it's immense and there's huge potential. Why? Hmm. Oh, oh, how did this happen? So when TikTok came to India, that was where our TG was. And so we started advertising on TikTok. And there's another story of how we got connected to TikTok. Okay. All of that. But we were one of the sort of top 10 spenders on TikTok in India as oh, a brand. Okay. Hmm. We used to spend 
फाइव लैख प्लस रुपीज अ डे वेन वॉज ट्वेंटी अप टू मिड ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी TikTok TikTok left or TikTok got shut down in India June 2020. So right. until then we 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 were were heavily advertising advertising on on the the platform. Maybe one year from mid mid 2019 2020. The last day we were advertising on TikTok. <laughs> so uh, I walked past my टॉप प्रोडक्ट है आयुर्वेदिक मसल गेन सप्लीमेंट सो आई वॉक पास्ट आर परफॉर्मेंस मार्केटिंग टीम एंड आई सॉ दिस एड रनिंग सॉर्ट ऑफ डिस्कसिंग एन एड एंड an ad short format. Like real type format ad with some really jarring music, some like really sort of weird effects okay. on the ad, um, and I just saw that ad and, and I was like, guys, like I know that obviously we have to cater to different TG than me, but my family name is on this. <laughs> I just can't have that ad run. I just don't want this ad to run. Please take it down. Huh. They're like, look, man. It's working well. No, look, man. If you want to do that, uh, we'll take the ad down. And I was like, "Cool, take it down." And then as I'm walking by, they're saying, "This ad is running at seven times ROS. Do you want to let the wow. ad shut down, right?" And I think that was the moment I realized I am not my customer, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. This this is another conversation that I had in one of the podcasts, which is that we are so restricted to the bubble that we live in. That um, jump out of the bubble. Exactly. We need to burst that bubble, jump out of the bubble. especially for entrepreneurs, right? very interesting what sort of um, startups are you interested in what sort of companies are you looking at is there a specific category or are you just looking at companies that come your way and just analyze them regardless I, from the fund at least i'm largely a consumer investor so we invest across the consumer landscape brands technology and d2c platforms. mostly mm. no we've invested in kuku fm okay. in the sort of content space we invested in a company called eka care right that's building on the equivalent of upi for health full mm. stack sort of patient health record management and more mm-hmm. invested in a education business out of kerala called entry right and then we've done some d2c brands um, local zero sugar ice cream called um, go zero okay um, and then we have done a, a cloud kitchen okay um, interesting business called dil foods mm. um, where on the front end looks like a house of cloud kitchen brands on the back end actually they are not owning any of the kitchens they tie up with offline restaurant owners who don't have online presence and allow them to use their spare capacity in the clinics to sort of retail their brand so we do um, anything consumer facing okay or okay. enabling the consumer but what do you look for the the what's your one or two things that you look for when investing look if really like basically see this is for the there'll be a lot of founders who will be looking at you and being like arjun no, i'll give the answer come, and come I'll, invest i'll give the answer and people will say that hey this guy is talking some <laughs> generic qualitative yeah. stuff but i look for three things okay. because i invest at the early stage right? so okay. founder is 50% of my decision okay who is that person why will they fight through tough times what's their right to win mm. right i think this is 50% of the decision 20% of the decision is on something that not as many investors index tam mm. total addressable market Why? Because I am investing today, and I want the brand to be able to grow five, ten times from where it is today. But there is no market left, and the brand is owning fifty, sixty percent of the market. It may not be the right investment for me, given the amount of capital I can put. And look, there are market creation stories that have existed. Vol Invest, our parent entity that sort of um, sponsored our fund as well, has invested in Sula, and they've had a great journey over the last ten, eleven years. The company has IPO'd, etc., all of that. But I have a smaller. pool of capital and so i okay. can't invest for 10 years mm, mm. Um, all through the life cycle right and so um is the market large enough that it the business can grow five times 10 times from when i invest uh, and the market should also support right? it's not just the entrepreneur and then the last 30% is what everybody talks about right it's the business economics team gross margin customer acquisition cost lifetime value bottom line profile etc all of that but also team Okay. Because so a business cannot be built alone. So fifty percent founder, twenty percent market size, and thirty percent business and team. Interesting. That's how I I, I create my mental model. Okay. Think okay. About okay. I'm gonna put myself on the spot here. Would you invest in Barely Opinionated? Uh, pitch to me. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm putting myself in a bad spot here. Okay. So Barely Opinionated is a new age media company, right? Our focus is to educate the younger generation about things that they need to know about. Every person has one single right, which is to vote. right but they are not using it properly and we are here to educate them on how they can use it properly using social media okay. so we are we are approaching a huge market using social media creating building this distribution who is the customer for you like who gives you um who pays you so brands pay us um we have brands that pay us at least as of now but then it's a distribution game right as we grow our distribution that is where we will have a larger market to cater to and there's a lot more scope um in terms of the business verticals that can be built 
today hmm. in the current form of your businesses content distribution plus brand solutions you don't need investor money correct um other than strategic investor money who can open doors for you typical investors um may not be the right answer because they'll put you on a treadmill that you don't need to be on hmm. um so i'd say in this avatar of the business capital is not needed hmm. and i do this a lot by the way hmm. while i am a vc i tell founder sometimes don't take money <laughs> because it'll actually be counterproductive for your Correct. business so in this format of the business i don't think you need money mm-hmm. even if i want to but it's money. about i think it's about the strategic people to get strategic people is different mm. very interesting okay that was a good exercise <laughs> to sort of go through um i want i want to hear your thoughts on shark tank because uh, shark tank has sort of taken the startup ecosystem to the next level and shark tank has sort of presented startups from the tier 2 tier 3 markets again which which have been amazing right and it has motive it has basically parents are okay with their kids building startups now i think th- i think the mainstreaming has been absolutely fantastic i think from my grandmother to five year old kids were seeing people watch shark tank were seeing people aspire to be entrepreneurs were seeing people understand more about entrepreneurship it's done an exceptional job in mainstreaming entrepreneurship it's done an exceptional job in making entrepreneurs heroes mm. our entrepreneurs been on shark tank gets noticed at places i nobody noticed me even my early days at doctor way there so i think the job of really respecting and appreciating the work that entrepreneurs put in is absolutely fantastic i think the sharks are also um sort of folks who have who really care about the ecosystem and i think it's just been outstanding i think it's been amazing i think more and more initiatives like need like this need to exist to put yeah. entrepreneurs on the pedestal but i'll tell you one disadvantage of shark tank and it's not something they can control i don't blame anyone for it but because of shark tank every entrepreneur now believes that businesses need funding from day 1 mm. or from day 10 or from day 20 and without that they are like फंडिंग के बिना तो नहीं कर सकते आई लाइक वाई डू वॉन्ट रेस फंडिंग यू डोट नीड दंडिंग शार्क टैंक पे तो लोग जाते हैं हमें भी जाना है हमें भी फंडिंग चाहिए like for example they the when, when the sh- when shark tank episodes come out they're very over dramatized and the way that's tv yeah that's they tv have to do that. but then don't you think that sort of t- changing the perception of building a startup where a lot more emotion is being put in and investors are making decision decision on emotions that's what See, investors them, don't make decisions on emotion it hmm. may be portrayed like that but the reality is an investor will put their money only where they believe the business can be large i think you want to do what you want to do if there wasn't emotion in it they won't have the trps it won't have the reach you'd get half or less than half of the reach and so the sort of objective is not met right right and so i think overall there will be some negatives but i think um if i were to view it as a whole i think it's an extremely positive thing for the indian startup ecosystem it has surpassed my expectation in terms of how big it got as well oh, really? so it's yeah, yeah i didn't expect it to be okay. and then we speak to the sharks as well even they are like we didn't expect it to be so big <laughs> right like it, it, they have it, they have become the bollywood stars at this it's point it's insane yeah like i i've been some of them are my friends i've been with mm. them in public places it's just insane what do you want to be a shark nobody invited me <laughs> <laughs> okay i have a small segment for you okay so we have this uh, underrated and uh, overrated okay? okay okay so you have these two cards and i'm going to give you a few startups okay uh, i want you to tell me if you think they are underrated or overrated okay? okay so you can just say underrated and you can show the card okay okay awesome so first is uh, zomato i think they have the rating they need <laughs> they're not underrated they're not overrated they're an awesome product but everybody knows about that's it a, and they are rated that's a very diplomatic no, answer no i i think it's not a it's not a hidden gem <laughs> uh-huh. and it's not a company that has more hype than substance it's there it's doing great everybody knows it and so it's okay it's okay i know this one is going to be biased but kuku fm definitely underrated i think um in their community lot of people know about what they are doing but in our world yeah um not enough people know and i think it's it's i i've done a, a little bit to, to change that but mm. i think they have a long way to go interesting um zepto i love it <laughs> i use it a lot um <laughs> but i can't say it's underrated for sure i don't think it's overrated because it's a kickass <laughs> product uh but i have to choose maybe no but then the, the the speed at which they sort of reach that billion dollar valuation the maybe speed at some, which maybe some amount of bubble there mm, or something mm, like that but mm. i just love the product i love the founders it's an I love amazing what yeah, built. yeah so if i had to choose i would say overrated was underrated but i i think it's kickass it's mm. too good interesting okay um 
again this might be a little biased but uh, nike uh, now i think it's it's where it should be okay um i think s- the stock got a huge bump up at ipo correct um in that crazy time that correct. we were at but now i think it's where it should be it's I, come I, down right yeah it's come down but it's it's in a fair place now it's a, like 5 billion dollars plus in value mm-hmm. so it's very well valued as a company i think if you see what happened with personal care in india over the last 10 years in a tier 3 city someone knows what salicyclic acid or hyaluronic acid is mm. and what a serum is and what a regime is nike has a large has had a large part to be nike and popular had a very large part to play in this hmm. personal care revolution that we've had in india nice okay um paytm paytm i think is still underrated underrated uh there is lots more that that user base can give mm-hmm. um and i think because of sort of what happened with the stock i think a lot of people didn't have as much faith in what vijay is building but i think there are so many businesses that can be built inside around or on paytm mm. i think he still got long way nice okay what go. about uh, jar jar i'm biased you're biased you're yeah, you an I'm angel in the company so oh, really? i'm very biased oh wow okay so i'll tell you it's underrated but no i think they When are did also you invest in uh, jar a while back okay. okay it must have been one and a half years ago that's done really well for you i'm guessing that let's see i always believe that until the outcome is there uh, uh i think uh, let's see but i think the company is doing very well i think they've also got um lots of uh, publicity Potential. and they're out there and stuff like that potential they're doing a great job i met nishchand actually last night right i was talking to him so i think overall exciting nice okay okay um last one which is uh, swiggy same as zomato yeah same okay. same as zomato i think i'll confess i use swiggy mm-hmm. uh i swiggy just like zomato the, swiggy i i just like the interface better yeah There is there's something about it which makes it like very appealing. I don't right? know some people use Zomato over Swiggy also. I, I even I, like I prefer Swiggy, Swiggy over I like Swiggy. Uh, Zomato. I use Swiggy. Nice. Okay. Okay. Um what are the three um startups and creators that you are very uh, you are very interested in or are looking into heavily? Yeah, so I'll I'll talk about creators. Um I'll be biased again to talk about my friends. I think Raj is a very close friend of mine. I've learned a lot of things from him. We spend a lot of time together. We share insights both ways. House of X actually one of the first business plans was written up at my house as well oh. the business he's building so we're really close I I just love what he's doing he inspires me uh because he is so far ahead of what I was at his age but I think we also are both my wife and I are able to give him some some feedback and mm-hmm. uh I think we were talking about this before we went on air Sarthak Ahuja um I think he creates or talks about things that are deep mm. um and not just massy stuff and i learn a lot from what he talks about but would you he's, classify him as a creator no but no right but he's uh, on social media yeah, right? yeah, so yeah, yeah, so yeah. him um and then i think another one i'm biased um he's a very close friend varun dugirala oh. um i just like the fact that he talks about things that not as many people are yeah. talking about and very niche and very an nice emotional psychological side to what we do as well and yeah mm-hmm. so i've learned actually before i had a kid um he gave me a lot of advice on parenting oh. um, and i took a lot of it and i learned a lot from him on that nice and what about three startups i'll talk about three spaces okay um that i'm very excited about right okay. so i think the first space is just um companies that are building for aspirational bharat mm-hmm. um or aspirational india as there is more and more capital flowing in um to the middle class as we have the largest youngest middle class or one of the largest youngest middle class in the world okay. and so as these consumers trade up i think lots of companies will be built across food and fashion and electronics and personal care etc so just companies talking about this aspirational consumer i think um we have lots and lots of potential in health and wellness mm-hmm. uh but in products that are unique mm-hmm. and that have ip not me too products um mm-hmm. uh, dr vedya as we saw the journey if you have a moat you do be patient mm-hmm. but i think in health and wellness unlike personal care there's still lots of room for growth um and then i'll talk about sort of more niche categories i think uh, luggage okay has a lot of premiumization that's going on okay. i think coffee um <laughs> there's a lot of lot of stuff happening and i think coffee i feel is so crowded now there's at like our a- price point ah true now let me explain something to you right um chai wala 15 mm. rupees now mm-hmm. not 5 15 rupees now mm. chai point chai 65 75 bucks correct starbucks third wave and blue tokai 250 <coughs> 300 bucks. see the gap correct there's nothing between 100 to 200 rupees so starbucks blue tokai third wave exceptional job they've done in that market but there has to be the equivalent of what i call cafe coffee day 2.0 hmm uh what cafe coffee day was 15 years correct. ago at school correct i think they are not 
aspirational anymore. And so at that price point, someone needs to come. Mm. Um, and then pets, I think, is an exciting space. Yeah, um, pets also I think growing it's a, a lot. It's still a small market, mm. but I think humanization of pets has gone through a huge fillip in the COVID time. So. When when we talk about chai, I want to talk about a specific case, right? Do you know about the about the controversy in the chai startup ecosystem? Okay, do you know Praful MBA Chaiwala? Hmm. 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 So his his business is basically a franchisee model, right? He's selling to the tier two, tier three market, but then his prices are very high, like seventy, eighty rupees for it for chai, and he's selling franchisees, which is um, at fifteen, twenty lakhs, but. people are not coming to the store because again it's very expensive right what do you think of this whole franchise have you ever dealt with franchisee models first of all second what? i haven't dealt with franchisee models um, so his franchises are mostly sold based on his because he's so he's become so famous he's that aspirational guy for a lot of the tier 2 tier 3 uh, market right so people buy his franchisee because they're like ha we want to be like praful look i i i saw something of this um, i think sometimes on social media like there are things that are put there that may or may not be true i don't know if it's true or not i i have no idea okay um i always like to give people the benefit of the doubt as well i would say uh, on a franchise business until the franchisee makes money mm. um you can sell as many franchises as you want but the franchisee has to make money mm. um and so uh, i think if you think about a franchise business um until the franchisee is benefiting as much as you are because if you take a fixed fee from a franchisee right uh they pay the fixed fee Correct. in lieu of what they are getting in terms of franchise but if their pnl doesn't make sense eventually your pnl will not make sense because you'll not be able to get the testimonials and grow Correct. from there um so i think um that's my view on franchise business, but i'm not invested or dealt with the franchise business yet okay. i mean in the future but yet i okay and what what do you think of the edtech sector now because in 2020 2021 the edtech sector boomed because of the internet you people were using internet right but now that the 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 covid era is sort of over um people are moving on to offline classes and everything now i think the world is hybrid right like i put a d i put a post on linkedin hmm. sometime in end of 21 saying i buy everything off online hmm. who buys anything offline hmm. and 6 months later i got totally proven wrong yeah. on offline open so i think the world is hybrid hmm. i think what edtech has done is democratize knowledge a lot hmm. um i teach a cohort based course on d2c 1050 plus That's on growth school right through growth school which yes. is one of my angel portfolio people from all over india are able to take this course and get this knowledge and that's beautiful but yeah we have the graduation at my home wow. offline right so i nice. think there is a hybrid model where you can use the positives of digital even if you think about commerce right mm. omni channel have an offline experience store that allows you to buy online don't keep all the inventory there or you get a lead online and you push them to your offline store i think the world will look more hybrid and edtech will go through the same experience do you push people to become entrepreneurs would you would you recommend people to become entrepreneurs i would recommend it's a beautiful journey but i would never push someone to become an entrepreneur if it doesn't come from within you and you force yourself to do it because it looks glamorous it's a disaster way to <laughs> Awesome. I think uh, we're coming towards the end of the uh, end of the podcast. I just have one one small segment for you. I am going to show you three four tweets, okay, on my on my laptop, and I want you to tell me your thoughts. So sure. on those tweets, okay. So um, first one is a little controversial. It's by Ashneer Grover. In India, there are four types of Twitter users: up mouthpiece, BJP mouthpiece, INC mouthpiece. People hoping elections get over soon, so the political hijack of Twitter gets over. You are a social media person. You use social media a lot. What do you think of this? I don't use Twitter as much, <laughs> but which is surprising. But I, 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 I can't use so many platforms, <laughs> man. You just have too much, uh, too much uh, time. Uh, I know that there is a lot of content, even if you see on Instagram, hmm. um, that that has some political sort of. hinge towards but i i i am a do very, you whenever I'm you read patriotic indian i wear this band with the indian flag on my hand so i would no but pa- patriotism so i would assume that there is not just this and yeah. there is some real stuff it's just who you follow honestly okay interesting so whenever you whenever you read content on social media because there are some people you you just know see i'm a student of politics right okay. um i studied economics and politics oh, in college okay. that's what i did huh. um so you have to be smart enough to be able to take the info, what 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 i used to do as an entrepreneur is take all the information all the feedback in process and then remove or act on only what mm. makes what sense makes sense to you, to you. you have to process yourself right? interest okay next one by elon musk how did most of the legacy media go from superheroes of free speech to super villains of super suppression what do you think 
I didn't even understand what he's trying to say. He's just trying to say that the the even even if you look at the Indian context, right? Most of our news channels are in some way mouthpieces. Yeah, I think the there's a inherent contradiction or challenge with the media business, mm -hmm. and that is that it's a business. <laughs> and so there are people who are paying for advertising mm. and so that's a tight the, rope how can how can a how can a media business be not a business and how can a, like how can news be free what do you think i i i think that look it's a i assume that editors of news outlets would have to go through a lot of tight rope walking mm. and take a lot of sort of ethical decisions on a daily basis uh and if you're running a business you're running a business so i don't know it's a tough one for them um, i have actually worked in the newsroom oh uh, wow for 3 months no 2 months okay i i Which was uh, barkha that's um, research assistant when she came to brown so i worked at ndtv in 2013 mm -hmm. it's very interesting interesting business but it's a very hard business you have to walk the tightrope so you you get the business like you you empathize with the business side of it but do you Are you no, okay? at the end of the day like to be very honest I don't watch the news any longer. You don't watch the news. Anymore. I used to love watching TV news. I don't watch it any longer. Interesting. Um so this is by Shantanu Deshpande. I I don't know if you've come I'm sure yeah, you've everyone come has across. come across this one. <laughs> He talks about how um the younger generation in their early 20s need to hustle 18 hours a day uh, at least for the first 4 5 years of their career to 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 get somewhere. What do you think? Is this something that you went through? Did you actually yeah, work yeah, for look, 18 hours look, a day? I will tell you uh, that um, this one, some of what he said, I would agree with, uh, and some of what he said, I won't agree with. I think the the way it was communicated, maybe maybe the use of the words "rona dhona," I think were taken. Um, people took offense to those words, etc. All of that. So I think from that perspective. Uh, I agree that hard work is really important mm -hmm. but I also believe there is something called burnout mm -hmm. and so there has to be a balance but I put in as an as an as a former also the other thing I I think is 18 hour days are very hard for a consistent yeah. basis yeah. Uh, from my experience working very hard I think 12 14 hours the max you can put in after that you start sort of reducing your productivity correct um, there's no point right work. so I I I'm a big proponent of hard work mm. I be, I'm not a smart worker I'm a hard worker right? right so I think from that perspective um some of what I agreed with um Some of what he said, I agree with, but I think the maybe some of the word usage offended people. But I think I, I don't completely disagree with what he said. Mm -hmm. Okay, Aman Gupta. Many people questioned whether we could really make in India. It wasn't easy. Obstacles lined the road, but we were unwavering in our commitment. We took a pledge to try our best to make in India. What do you think about making? Yeah, I think make in India is uh, something that I resonate with a lot. Mm -hmm. I think manufacturing for a very long time was outside of India and we were importing products. I think the place we are in right now, lots of global brands want to come to India and manufacture mm -hmm. here. They have come before 15 20 years ago with a suboptimal experience and left in certain industries. As more and more stuff comes to India, we have to start thinking world class. Mm -hmm. Only if we think world class and not kind of okay maybe um will we take it forward. Lots will come to India. Mm -hmm. what comes to india has to be given a world class experience a world class output so that more and more comes to india so um, a lot of startups just sort of incorporate the make in india segment just to get that tag right which which sort of promote their brand what do you think of that do you think that's that's okay be, be true if you're made in china <laughs> and you put a box in india then it's not real but i think the overall initiative see there will always be sort of hmm. people who abuse certain things but i think the overall sentiment, sentiment. behind made in india is fantastic okay I think this is the last one. Ashish Grover again. India is super fun, super ironic. Uncle sipping on their drinks, smoke in hand, bragging about how they made their fortunes in land speculation by putting their cash to good use, planning their next casino trip to Macau and passing judgment on online gaming and how it's spoiling the youth. Would love to see government introduce 28% GST and 20% TCS. on land purchases <laughs> no comment on this i'm not from the gaming industry i think 28% gst is tough for that industry but i'm not from that industry so uh, no yeah I, i i feel bad for the founders but i'm not from the industry okay awesome so that was it arjun uh, thank you so much for kick ass rohit i really enjoyed it Taking had a great time. time and and yeah thank you so much i hope you had a good conversation super super conversation yeah? thanks awesome. so much thank you so much pleasure